I love this time of year. Um, this being one of them this afternoon, the celebration of baptisms. Uh, when August rolls around, you know, it just feels like we are committed, all of us, to squeezing as much as we can out of these last weeks. We're not going to talk about what's coming, you know, but we've got, and we've got some big things. We've got the summit. We're getting ready for the gathering coming up at the end of the month. Um, this is an exciting time. Weddings, I, I know of three weddings yesterday that took place. We had one down in the sanctuary. There was also, uh, Jeff had a wedding out uh, under the Campanile yesterday, and I know there was one at Naz. I mean, how many of you this summer at some point have been, been to a wedding? How, how many of you? All right, quite a few, quite a few of you. Um, I officiated at a wedding uh, a couple weekends ago down in the sanctuary, and early in the service, I noticed the best man uh, out of the corner of my eye was beginning to, to sway, <laughs> but like this. And uh, fortunately, he averted disaster and walked out of the room under his own power. Uh, and after a few minutes, the groom, I noticed he was just staring at me intently, and and, and when he finally had my full attention, he mouthed to me, the rings, which were, of course, in the best man's pocket. <clears throat> and I thought, okay, yeah, that's something we're going to have to figure out. Uh, but to everyone's relief, the best man came in just in time, just, just before they exchanged their vows. Have any of you ever been to a, a, a perfect wedding? You haven't, have you? You haven't, because there's no such thing. There's no such thing as a perfect wedding. Why? Because something always goes wrong. My sister, she was married uh, on a hot, humid Saturday afternoon about 40 years ago. Um, about 30 minutes before the service started, her wedding cake, which was perched on this card table, in the church, unair conditioned church basement, ready for the reception, surrounded by this beautifully arranged flowers and napkins, that wedding cake fell over. And it did one of those slow motion tumbles that's just agonizing to watch from across the room, but you know there's nothing you can do about it. And it was interesting, we were talking about this backstage. And two other people sitting in the huddle also experienced the same thing at, at their weddings. So 30 minutes before the wedding began, my sister had a card table that was covered with cake and napkins and flowers smeared with frosting. But I think what helped was that the wedding ceremony itself was delayed enough that the cake maker was able to build a brand new cake out of spare parts that she had at home. Now, I don't know if you knew that, that wedding cake makers do that. They have spares just in case a cake tumbles. So there was just enough time to make a new cake. And the reason why the cake maker had just enough time was that the groom's father, my brother-in-law, his father had a gallbladder attack. Right before the service started, he was crumpled up on the floor in so much pain in his nice suit, he had to wait for a doctor to come and dope him up to the point of being incoherent so that he could just be perched up in the front row throughout the service. And that all took about 30 minutes, which was just enough time for a new cake to be made from the spare cake parts. Something always goes wrong at a wedding. Friend of mine, who often says that he married the woman he loves and he loves the woman he married, was lucky he got married at all. He had a wedding that was a disaster. To begin with, the minister didn't show up for the rehearsal. How can you have a wedding rehearsal without the minister? Well, they didn't. He got married about 50 years ago. And he said that the poorly fitted pastel tuxedos that he and the groomsmen wore made them all look like Paul Revere and the Raiders. <laughs> all right, I'm glad some of you are laughing. Some of you are just laughing because you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Louie, Louie, oh baby, now we gotta go. 
yeah, 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 yeah. You know that one? That's Paul Revere and the Raiders in their pastel tuxedo with the frilly shirts. So an hour before this guy's wedding, my friend's wedding, one of the groomsmen threw up. Half hour before the wedding, the groom ripped the seat out of his pastel tuxedo pants. And when the, when the ceremony began, the bride was crying so hard that her nose was running uncontrollably throughout the entire service. And at the end, after the couple was pronounced man and wife and they began to recess down the center aisle, the best man accidentally stepped onto the bridal train. And as the bride continued to walk forward, the headband that was connected to the train stretched back like a rubber band until the best man finally realized what he was doing and he took his foot off the train. And you know what happens when you stretch a rubber band? It shot forward and shot the headband and the train up into the air. However, the bride, the bride somehow kept moving and just reached up into the air with her free hand, grabbed the headband and slammed it back down onto her head. And my friend said that it was at that moment that he knew that his brand new wife was some amazing woman. So something always goes wrong at a wedding. There's always a glitch, a hiccup, a mistake, something forgotten, the, the soloist, loses her place, the groomsman loses his contact lens, the bridesmaid loses the heel on her shoe, the best man loses the ring, the mother-in-law loses her cool, the flower girl loses her nerve and runs back down the aisle crying, the wedding underneath the campanile on you and I's campus loses a cloudless sky and the rain begins to fall, or the groom loses consciousness and drops to his knees like he's been shot in the spine with an elephant tranquilizer. <laughs> Something, say it with me, always goes wrong at a wedding, even weddings in the Bible. The Gospel of John in the New Testament says that a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee, and sure enough, something went wrong. So we're going to look at the story. Second chapter of John, uh, John's account of Jesus' life. Verses 1 and 2, John writes, A wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Now Cana is this little tiny village tucked into the green hills of Galilee, just about three miles outside of Nazareth. I had another friend who was on a tour of the Holy Lands about 25 years ago, and I remember him talking about how thrilled he was when as he, he walked down the cobblestone streets of Cana. He turned a corner, and there he saw this big crowd of people gathered in the town square, and they were ringing cowbells and laughing and clapping and cheering. And he realized it's a wedding reception, a wedding in Cana of Galilee, just like the story of the Bible. Now, in Bible times, weddings were these big, lavish, long-lasting affairs. Uh, celebration could last like a week, and new guests would arrive every day, and the wine would flow freely at those events. And at this particular wedding, in John's story, I just imagine things were, were going along just fine. The goat meat was grilled to perfection. The guests smeared olive paste on brown bread, and it was delicious. The rabbi's teaching was mercifully short. The bride was beaming. The groom was handsome. Everything was perfect. Nothing could go wrong. And then just then, something did. Something did go wrong. Verse 3. Jesus' mother said to Jesus, They have no more wine. They ran out of wine. Don't know why. Maybe more people came to the reception than they anticipated. Maybe the caterers slipped up. Who knows? What we know is they ran out. And Jesus' mother tells Jesus about this. 
with a clear expectation that he's going to do something about it. But Jesus, who wouldn't turn stones into bread when challenged by Satan in the wilderness, is not about to get into the catering business. And he says, verse 4, Dear woman, why do you involve me? Is this what you think it means to be the Messiah, Mom? Providing refreshments at parties? But the mother of Jesus wouldn't take no for an answer, and she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you, and goes off. And apparently Jesus gives in. And isn't that interesting? Even Jesus, the Son of God, couldn't hold out to his mom. When mom says jump, us boys respond by saying, how high? Yeah. You know, it's, to me, it's really comforting to know that Jesus understands what it means to have a mom. So what does Jesus do? He orders that six stone jars, each with a capacity of, of 20 to 30 gallons, be filled up with water. And then in verse wine, or verse wine, Verse 9, <laughs> verse 9, the water becomes wine. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. You know, there's no explanation for the miracle, just the water turned into wine. You think about it, God makes grape juice out of rainwater all the time. And Jesus just sped up the process. The water turned into wine, says John. And it's not just any old wine. No cheap, screw-top, syrupy, sweet wine. This was the real deal. The kind that actor used to brag about on the TV commercial when he said, we will sell no wine before it's time. This is the good stuff. Aged to perfection in the blink of an eye. Verse 10. After he tasted the wine, the master of the banquet called the bridegroom aside and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you've saved the best to last. You know, he's referring to that tactic of serving your good wine early in the celebration when the guests are still in a condition to appreciate it. And then later on in the week, when maybe your guests couldn't tell a Chardonnay from swamp water, then you bring out the two-buck chuck, the stuff you bought on sale. But you've saved the best till now, he says. And then finally, verse 11. This, the first of his miraculous signs... Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. John says that Jesus chose to reveal his glory for the first time at, of all places, a wedding. Now, there's three other books in the New Testament that tell Jesus' life story. In the book of Matthew, Jesus begins his public ministry by speaking in Galilee. And in the book of Mark, Jesus begins his ministry by inviting Simon and Andrew and James, James and John to, to follow him. And then in the book of Luke, Jesus begins by going to the synagogue and opening up the scroll from the prophets and reading. And to be honest, that's what you might expect Jesus to do when he steps out of the shadows and into the public eye, to, to preach, to call his followers to him, to read from the scriptures. And then along comes John. John, who writes about this man who calls himself the bridegroom. And he begins his story of this man, Jesus, at a wedding where people had a little too much to drink. Imagine having Jesus show up at your wedding. What a difference it would make in people's wedding planning if they expected Jesus to show up. But he does, you know. 
Jesus does show up at weddings and he still turns water into wine. He takes human love in all of its weakness and imperfections and he turns it into this intoxicating miracle that we call a marriage. You know, we think that the most important person at a wedding is the bride. She's not. Matter of fact, in our story here, from John, the bride isn't even mentioned. She's anonymous. Jesus is the most important person at the wedding. You know, Governor Reynolds can give you a license that makes it legal for you to live together, but only God can make you husband and wife. Only Jesus turns the water into wine. And I wonder why he doesn't always do that. I mean, why do some people get the miracles while others don't? At a previous church I worked at in Sioux City, there was a lady who frequently phoned the church. Most often she would call on Saturday mornings and I was usually there, which I think she knew, and, and we talked, I don't know, maybe a dozen times over the years. <clears throat> I don't know her name. I know her first name, but I never knew her full name. I ne never actually met her. We would just talk on the phone every once in a while. And I don't know if something went wrong at this woman's wedding, but she seemed to feel as though nothing was going right in her marriage. And maybe some of you feel that way, that somehow the water never got turned into wine. She would tell me about her life, how she was so envious of her friends, how they all seemed so happily married, and she was mad. She was so mad that that wasn't happening to her. She was mad at herself. She was mad at her husband. She was mad at God. She would call him the guidepost God, just like the magazine, guidepost. I grew up with guidepost magazine at home all the time. Here's a couple of old issues from the 70s. On the end table, in the TV room, in the basket, in the bathroom, on the kitchen counter, my grandmother would clip stories out of guideposts and send them to me when I was in college and when I was in seminary. And this woman in Susetti said that in Guidepost magazine, all the stories had happy endings. There were stories of people who got the miracle, people whose water got turned into wine. God would talk to them in complete sentences. He would whisper to the Christian professional golfer which club to use to win the tournament. He would tell the, the Christian housewife in California to bottle her homemade barbecue sauce and she would make millions. He would steer a young woman into the right place at the right time and she would meet this wonderful Christian husband. And she would say to me, in guideposts, there's always a picture of some happy woman that looks like an astronaut's wife, all blonde and smiley, whose prayers God has answered. The people in guideposts always get the miracle. For them, the water always gets turned into wine. Some people get the miracle, but some don't. I know people, and maybe you're one of them, who pray without ceasing for some water to turn into wine. And it doesn't happen. And you read guideposts, and there's the survivor of the airplane crash. There's the pitcher who throws the no-hitter. There's the, the cancer victim who, whose disease went into remission. There's the college basketball star who said a prayer during timeout and then swished the three-pointer to win the game. And you think, why doesn't that stuff happen to me? Why don't I get the miracle? How come my water doesn't turn into wine. And John says that when Jesus performed his first miracle that his disciples saw it and they put their faith in him, they followed him, 
And you know what? I think it's easy to have faith when you get the miracle. But Jesus went on to say this to his friends at the end of the book of John. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And I guess that's the Bible verse for the lady on the phone in Sioux City. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, Jesus begins his most famous teaching called the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes. Now, Beatitudes are a a literary form that usually begins with the word blessed. And then it points to the integrity and the, the morality and the goodness of a person. And the character of this person being praised in the Beatitude is so strong that it deserves a reward. So here's what Jesus said. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And at the end of the book of John, Jesus said this beatitude. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who who don't get the miracle. Blessed are those for, for whom the water stays water and they still believe. They still hang on to the hope that there's a God in this world and he has a good plan for all of us on the night before he died Jesus fell to his knees in the garden and he prayed for a guidepost answer he said father if it's possible may this cup be taken from me and did he get a guidepost answer No. He didn't. Instead, he got a Gethsemane answer. And yet, he still believed that God meant him good. And he said, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus praises everyone who doesn't get the miracle, those whose water doesn't turn into wine. He says, blessed are you, for you are the sort of people that make up my kingdom. Now, I don't know where you are this morning. From my experience over the years, we agree as a staff that 
one out of every five, one out of every four people that come to church any particular Sunday morning come with a broken heart. And maybe life isn't happening the way you expected it to happen. Maybe you've been disappointed just one too many times. Maybe it's your family, your health, your job, your finances. Maybe your prayers aren't being answered. Maybe the water isn't turning into wine. My encouragement to you this morning, first, is to keep praying. Keep praying. Remember, even Jesus prayed for a miracle. He prayed for a guidepost answer. So keep praying. And if the miracle comes, be grateful. Thank and praise God for changing the water into wine. But be prepared for a Gethsemane answer. The water may stay water. You may not get a miracle. And in those cases, remember that Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So be strong. Be courageous. Believe. God may not have not done a miracle, but he's still there. He's still with you, and he's still for you. Something always goes wrong at a wedding. There's no such thing as a perfect wedding, and there's no such thing as a perfect life. Something does and will go wrong. And sometimes God takes the water and he turns it into wine. And we see and we believe. But sometimes the water just stays water. It's easy to believe when we can see. But blessed are those who don't see. And yet they still believe. Let's pray. God, that's a hard one. It's hard to... Uh, it's hard to trust you in those times where it doesn't feel like you're showing up. So I pray, God, that through your Spirit, we may have the maturity and the strength to believe, to believe in you, to trust you even on those days when it seems as though you're so quiet. God, we thank you for those times when you show up in powerful ways, in ways in which we can only say it's, it's God. It's you, Father. That's what just happened. But please help us so that when we don't see, we can still believe.